how many people are using Ansible today or have tried it out here in the, all right, pretty good number of like almost half of everybody here. Um, if you haven't, it's really easy to get started. Uh, this is going to be a little introductory. This is approximately the same presentation I gave uh, for PyCon US. Uh, but we'll kind of, if people have specific questions, it's a small crowd, it's easy to take lots of questions along the way. Um, you kind of see some of the reasons we built it. Uh, also, do we lose audio again? Mm. It, it might just take a while to update. The, uh, the audio is great. Uh, we're just not seeing any uh, desktop share. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep talking. Um, okay. So, so we kind of learned some reasons about why we built it the way we did. Uh, even if, so if you're not even an Ansible user when we're done, which I hope you are, you'll hopefully learn some Python things as well. There's a train. All right. Uh, to give a little bit of background, um, I've been doing IT automation for uh, a little over a decade or so, um, most notably at Red Hat, previously at IBM. But at Red Hat, I built a tool called Cobbler. And Cobbler was the Python power tool that helped manage PHCP and DNS, uh, Pixie environments for bringing up bare metal servers and all those kind of things. And Cobbler got to be pretty widespread. Um, and as a result of that, I got to be uh, pretty well in tune with a lot of admins and developers who were uh, looking at configuration management and other automation tools at the time. Built a tool called Funk that not too many people use anymore. Uh, Funk was used at Tumblr, uh, so it was used by Fedora for a while. Uh, Cobbler was used uh, a lot in Wall Street. Uh, deployed the servers underneath Modern Warfare 2 and 3, if anybody played those games. Uh, Render Farms kind of all over the place, all the way down to small labs. Um, Left there for a while, um, ended up working for Puppet Labs for a little bit, which is kind of in the configuration management space as we are to an extent. Uh, got to experience some of uh, their customers and their users firsthand. Um, and then worked for some other places where I tried to introduce IT automation into them, but they always had problems with complexity or certain features. Um, so the idea, these kind of things all rolled together and, and basically came up with, well, how can we make this not only simpler and easier to use, but also uh, a lot more capable? So what is Ansible? Um, Ansible handles lots of different things. So application deployment. Assuming I have a Linux or Unix system or a Windows system today, um, how do I get my applications onto that system once it already exists? How do I do database upgrades and, and that kind of thing? Um, configuration management. How do I configure the base OS? What packages and services are installed? Uh, maybe I've got SE Linux to configure. Um, cloud provisioning. How do I... Uh, describe the resources that are running in my cloud. How do I bring up new instances, tear down instances, control uh, cloud storage, uh, cloud networking, all those kind of things. Um, ad hoc task execution. How do I uh, reboot servers at certain points of time? How do I uh, apply a hotfix or maybe run some just arbitrary script that I need to run uh, in parallel across a large number of hosts? And multi-tier orchestration and, and with that, continuous deployment. So suppose I have an architecture that is not completely homogenous. Suppose I have web servers, and database servers, content management servers. Uh, how do I update them in very specific orders and patterns? And continuous deployment, how do I update those in a way that I don't produce any downtime across my systems as I'm updating 500 systems at a time? Maybe I only want to take 10 or 50 out of the load balancer at a time. So Ansible does all of those things from one tool because we thought before uh, it was kind of a shame to have to pick up four tools to do this. Um, so, in the beginning, one of the most popular configuration management tools was CF Engine. Uh, CF Engine 2 was the first one to get mainstream, and in the course of CF Engine 2 becoming, uh, giving way for CF Engine 3, there was a bit of a decision point in everyone's history. Why do I want to move to this uh, different, incompatible thing? Uh, Puppet started getting popular, Chef started rising onto the scene, and it was there. Um, but those do configuration management, so those are some of the things that you'd be familiar with in, in that suite of applications. Uh, application deployment, uh, you more commonly hear about Fabric, uh, written in Python, powered by Paramico, uh, things that Ansible both uses, not Fabric, but Paramico, um, and obviously Python, uh, or, or Capistrano in the Ruby world, right? Uh, things that are a lot more scripty, a lot more imperative. Uh, Ansible is kind of a hybrid between those two things. And uh, if on the cloud provisioning, you kind of think of things like cloud formation, which Ansible has a module for, but uh, also providing higher level resources that make it even easier to describe cloud resources and we're talking about uh, multiple cloud providers, so not just um, not just EC2 and Rackspace and those kind of providers, but smaller ones like DigitalOcean, Linode, but also things like VMware and OpenStack. 
So there's a wide range of addressable um, topologies. So you can bring up your infrastructure completely from scratch, set up the base OS, deploy your applications on top of that, uh, and then manage the updates in the full life cycle of that application. Uh, and it kind of gets there because it's, it's a lot less dogmatic, right? There's a, you know, I'll kind of show you what that means as we go. Um, so what's kind of Ansible philosophy? What, how does it bake, right, before you start showing some examples? Uh, this talk's gonna show you a lot about how to use Ansible. Um, for those that are more interested in the Python guts, uh, I'll, I'll be showing a little bit of that, but you can just also dig through the source on GitHub and we'll talk about that too. Um, agent list is the number one. So with a lot of configuration management and automation tools, you have to install an additional root level daemon on the remote systems. And that daemon presents some problems. One is that you have to install it before you can do anything. So if you have a thousand systems, that's a problem. Not only that, I need to upgrade those agents. Um, I may need to deal with security vulnerabilities. They might fall over and crash. Can I use the management software to restart them after the agent has crashed? Well, I need something else to do that, right? Um, so agentless is Ansible's number one key strength. We built it using SSH from day one. Um, and we spend a lot of time optimizing that, making it very fast and efficient, supporting things like uh, SSH keys and passwords, Kerberos, uh, Paramico native open SSH. It can do bastion hosts. It can do um, control persist to keep connections alive. Uh, it can work with sudo and sudo. Um, Ansible should not be your day job. This is, I think, is super key. So um, as a story, I was uh, in, in the wake of a one startup that exploded at one point. Uh, I, was, I was working at Cisco, and uh, Cisco had, uh, had some OpenStack content, and I was, I was finding myself that we spent uh, a disproportionate amount of time wrangling Puppet, right? So it was keeping me from writing code. Uh, the, one of the things that's nice about Ansible is it doesn't keep you from writing code. You can usually write whatever automation you need and go back to something that's a lot more interesting. Uh, as a result, you should get excited because Ansible helps make your life easier, but on the other hand, it should be insanely boring. Um, so you should be able to get it done and the content should work and be obvious. Um, try to avoid the hieroglyphics and, and the fancy management. Um, so like I said, keep things simple, uh, keep things audible. So one of those examples is like, if you could see the history of an Ansible playbook, which is the, the text-based automation, that describes how it works, um, the diffs and being able to read it. You should be able to read it even if you don't know Ansible. You should be able to understand what it does. It should not be able to hide behavior. And uh, like one of our users is Gawker, and Gawker uh, does uh, like 50,000 simultaneous users commenting on their website all through the night, right? Um, and they update their infrastructure 10 times an hour without losing any downtime. But one of the cool stories there is like an IT manager says, I can give my guys a list of 10 things to do. He doesn't know Ansible. They come back, show him a playbook, and he can look it over and say, yeah, I understand. These are the steps that I want you to do, and he can read it and understand it. Um, and I thought that was kind of missing in the IT automation space, especially as, as many things approached uh, kind of code levels of complexity. Um, I love writing code. I'm a developer by nature, but I don't want to write that uh, against my infrastructure because I'd rather be writing the business application. Um, batteries included. So we kind of rally the open source community. I've got some specific community statistics. I think uh, maybe next uh, batch of slides in, but we kind of rally everybody to work together to a common core of modules. So the idea that um, you have to go find the community implementation that works like manages services or manages users or groups or whatever. Um, well, those are in most config tools, but we've got things for like databases. So we've got a Postgres module, right? That can, and that's in core. So you don't have to go hunt for the best community implementation. And the result of that is we have like almost 900 contributors now helping to maintain everything that's in Ansible. And uh, that means not only bugs are fast, fixed really fast, but we have all the features exposed. Like the EC2 stuff is really, really up to date. Um, because we encourage everybody to give back to that common base. Um, so a little bit of statistics about the community and the project. Um, Ansible is approximately 2.5 years old. It was started in February of 2012. Uh, my perception of time is bad. If that doesn't, if the math doesn't add up, that's close. Um, we uh, started a company around it uh, approximately a year and a half ago. We're about a 30-person company now. We're located in uh, Durham under uh, American Tobacco, just down the street. Uh, so right underneath the smokestack by the Divinity School. Um, and we also have a lot of distributed remote employees. Um, some on our services team, some on a, some developers and so on, but we've got a, a pretty strong Durham presence, so glad to be here for sure. Um, I think the uh, one of the first public presentations I did was uh, the one of the Triangle DevOps ones when Argyle Social was just on the street, so uh, good to be back for sure. Um, we are...
or we were one of the top five most contributed to projects on GitHub in 2013. So that was 665 unique people adding code. Um, actually, that might be the total number. Anyway, there's like over almost 900 people that have added code now. Uh, but up there with Rails and AngularJS and Homebrew. So uh, those are all projects that people know. Um, Ansible may have flown a little bit under the radar uh, among certain, you know, in the web development circles and so on. But uh, uh, getting to be extremely popular um, and, you know, what it's like this year is completely different than it was like previously. So um, it's not unusual for us to get like 20 pull requests a day. So a lot of what we do is, is curate that open source community and manage it. Um, gives me a lot of respect for what Linus does. Um, you, you think you understand that level of chaos and it's another thing in practice altogether. Um, so one of, the, one of the top 10 Python projects on GitHub in terms of stars and forks. Um, so on GitHub's trending, I think we're, we're usually up in the top five these days. Um, not because it's beautiful code, but I guess mostly because it's, it's useful and it happens to be implemented in Python, right? Not everything has to be a, a web development framework for a particular language. Uh, with Ansible, we write automation in, in YAML, a data format, uh, so that it, it's relevant for people of all languages. So if you're writing Java, you're writing Ruby, it doesn't matter. Um, the people that wrote RVM have, a, have Ansible roles for deploying RVM. Uh, you know, Tomcat, no problem. Didn't matter what you're writing. Um, and we add a new contributor about every 1.3 days. So um, it's, you know, like I said, massively wide scale kind of open source things. Now we're going to get into the interesting bits. Um, yeah, after we get past some of the less interesting bits. <laughs> um, some of the uh, interesting use cases, NASA.gov. If you go to NASA.gov on your phone, that's uh, deployed by Ansible. Um, I don't think they deploy any, we deploy any, uh, any uh, rockets or anything with NASA, we do with uh, another space company, um, a couple satellite companies as well. Uh, Rackspace uses Ansible to deploy all of their OpenStack infrastructure, so 5,000 machines at a time doing data center updates, um, massive uh, force levels of Ansible, all going in parallel, updating things, uh, checking machines in and out of load balancers, doing SSH key rotation, patching heartbeat, whatever you need it. Uh, there's a lot of really nice examples at Rackspace. Um, Fedora and edX are both good examples. So edX is the uh, MIT slash Stanford slash whoever else um, initiative to kind of develop some open courseware solutions. Uh, Fedora, obviously the, the, the relatively famous Linux distribution out of Red Hat, sort of the upstream Varel as it, as it were, even if they don't necessarily want to say that. Um, both of those people use Ansible uh, almost exclusively for infrastructure management, edX is exclusive. Um, Fedora's most of their way there to being completely on Ansible. Uh, all their content is open source, so you can read all their playbooks if you want. They're not necessarily pretty. I mean, they're definitely uh, getting the job done. Uh, but you can kind of, get, there's a lot of Ansible content to read on the web if you want to see how other people are doing everything. I talked about Gawker deploying, uh, you know, five or ten times an hour. Uh, Pokemon.com, I think that's the one I may be most proud of. I don't know why. Um, huh? Yes, the onion. That's uh, that was new recently as well. So it's uh, I, I never was into the Pokemon, but uh, when you see things like IGN and uh, and the onion and websites used to read like 15 years ago, still playing the software, you didn't think of, you wouldn't even have thought about writing them. That's kind of cool. Um, MapArt using this for installer. Uh, GoPro, Care.com, Evernote applications you might use. Uh, so um, actually, the interesting part. So Ansible keeps track of what host you want to talk to by creating a standard INI file inventory. You can actually talk dynamically and slurp your list of hosts from the cloud or whatever database system you want to do. It's completely pluggable. But uh, if I wanted to find that I had two web servers, I can just make an INI file. This web server thing is a group of two servers. So showing that once I've created that INI file, if I want to use call a module against them, here I'm calling the ping module. I say Ansible space web servers, that's the name of the group, dash M. Ping. Ping is the module. And from there, it'll go out and run the ping module against all of those servers in parallel. Um, this is not actually an ICMP ping. What it's doing is it's using SSH to transfer a module that returns a JSON packet. So this is just kind of a generic example. Uh, another module we have is shell. So using the shell module here, um, what we're showing is executing a shutdown command in two minutes, so this is kind of an example of a, a go home for Christmas, shut down the lab in one line, right? So rapidly bring down a very large number of servers. 
Um, that's the most basic level of Ansible. That's uh, what we would call the runner level, right? Uh, Ansible playbooks are the interesting part. Uh, a playbook is really where you describe a recipe for a system or a set of operations. You can kind of think of it as a, as a flow chart of sorts, checked into source control usually. Um, you hear the phrase infrastructure is code. Usually it doesn't mean code so much as I'm keeping track of the things in source control. When I change the, script, the rules that describe my infrastructure, I'm going to commit them to get and, uh, and keep track of them that way. So in this example, remember we previously defined a group of web servers. Here we're um, talking to them and we're applying various roles. So we're saying, apply my base config that might set up some certain packages that are installed, that might configure my security settings, uh, deploy a web server, and set up these servers to be monitored by my monitoring system. So this is how simple an Ansible playbook can look. This is not a demo. This is uh, so much as it could actually be this simple, right? Because roles kind of bundle up this unit of reusability within Ansible. Uh, they make it uh, a way to Sure thing. So if you haven't seen YAML before, this is just a list of lists. So here's a list, uh, and the list is a hash or a dictionary. Uh, for those of you that like the Python terms, <laughs> we're saying uh, what host should I talk to? Talk to the group named web servers. And here's a list of roles to apply. Um, roles in Ansible are just a list of paths. They look like this. So you have a directory called roles. The web server role has uh, paths in it. it. Has these things called handlers. Handlers are uh, tasks that can respond to change. So if you were to uh, edit a configuration file manually and rerun Ansible, it would say, oh, I had to replace this file. Because this change, run this handler. So you can say, this configuration file change now restart my web service automatically. Um, you can push files around. You can uh, template configuration files using Jinja 2. Uh, for those coming from a Ruby world, if anybody's there online, uh, very similar to ERB. Um, you can also just, uh, have variables bundled with your roles and have some metadata about them. But what is, yes? When you push, do you have the ability to actually do a comparison, comparison and only push things that have changed? Or do you just, we're going to push all this? Um, yeah, so Ansible uh, follows all the, uh, the general phrase that people like to use. Uh, it's frequently misapplied as idempotence uh, or, or declarativeness uh, is probably a better term. Um, so that it's, it's smart. So. It may transfer a file into a tempter or something, but it knows not to copy it over unless it actually has to change. So for instance, if, you, if you're saying a service should be started, if that service is already running, it's smart enough to know not to execute that service command. Um, actually, the, the file copy text cmd 5 sub first. So yes, it does. Um, and then the template module works, works in very much the same kind of way. Um, so an example task file, if you can kind of think about that web server role, here we're using the Yum package manager uh, to say that a web service uh, or a package HTTP, which is Apache, uh, should be installed. We're now saying from the control machine, suppose that's my laptop or a, a common server all my team's working from, might be Jenkins box. We have a product called Ansible Tower where I'll talk about. Uh, push the Jinja2 template for HTTP.com to uh, on this remote path, I can also pass the file mode. I really should have done that. I should have just by the mode in the motor. Um, and if this file changes or when it's copied the first time, if there's ever a change, restart the web service. So um, it's smart. It doesn't. It knows not to restart things. It doesn't need to restart. And here at the bottom, I'm making sure that's running. Um, there's. Uh, I forget this every time I use this deck. It also should say enable equals yes. Make sure that when I reboot the server, it comes back up. Um, so that's kind of an example of how simple a task file can be. So if you can remember, uh, like this example, right, how simple a, a, this is like the top level file is, and then you've got, you know, files like here sitting in the task directory, like a main.yaml file, being like legitimately the simple, lots of white space. Uh, YAML is indentation sensitive, just like Python. Um, it can make it really easy to read. Uh, it does go straight down top to bottom. So uh, most people really like that about Ansible because, um, I mean, I work for Puppet. I use a lot of it. I've written lots of Puppet content. Manually wiring dependencies together to me is hell. I really know the order I want things to run in almost all the time. And especially when you're deploying software, I want to be able to list things in exactly that order. Um, I think they've actually fixed that as a default. I have heard from employees that it doesn't work, but maybe it does. I don't know. Um, the, but 
but anyway, so like most systems try to be order based. Um, and then we have the notify to handle like the dependencies that matter, right? So like if there's something changes. The other thing I'm not showing here is we can do conditionals, we can do loops and all those kind of things inside of Ansible. So I can say, save this result and then uh, depending on the result of this one command, like decide or, or not to run something else. Um, so that's kind of not shown. I'll pull up the doc site and just, actually, let me just go ahead and do that. Um, so if you go over here, um, if you don't get anything else out of this presentation that I'm talking too fast. Docs.ansible.com is uh, reasonably, uh, very comprehensive, I would say. So it gets, you start here with the introduction. It's kind of organized in the way that you want to learn things. There's some few videos embedded in the middle of it. Uh, it'll kind of introduce things in the basic order, starting from just the command line and the inventory file, and then moving into some of the advanced, more advanced concepts. There's also a index of all the modules by category. So if you want to see what we can do with cloud, um, here's all the cloud modules. Uh, a lot of EC2 stuff in here. You can see GCE, Quantum uh, for OpenStack users, Rackspace modules, all kinds of good stuff in there. So um, docs.ansible.com is, is a really, really good resource there. Um, so some properties of Ansible that make it interesting. I think we talked about the agentless one already. Um, order based, we talked about that. Um, security is really important, right? So I, to me, it's important that you don't open up additional ports, that you use something that is as peer reviewed as OpenSSH. Um, OpenSSH dodge part lead by, you know, a, a hair, but it's, it's nice to not develop your own custom agents. I've written SSL programs before. It's very easy to get SSL wrong. It's even worse to invent your own cryptography. So we're going to stay really far away from that. Uh, we know system software. We're not cryptographers. Uh, so use something that's really great that's already out there running on all your systems so you can just instantly manage them. Um, let me see if I can jump back here. All right. Um, support passwords or keys, root or non-root. So if you need a, if you have an install step or like need to run this user as Postgres, I need to run the step as Imdahan. You can do that. You don't have to. You don't have to be running specifically as root. Um, you can use keys or passwords, whatever you want to do. Um, there's lots of logging. Uh, you know, Tower has some really nice logging features in our products, but uh, basically you can write a callback to log everything. There's syslog that gets logged on all the remote nodes. Uh, you don't need a server to get started. You can just you know use it from your laptop. And, and again, no extra demons on the remote side. So uh, we also spend a lot of time tuning things. So I think there's a lot of FUD that gets thrown out about SSH, and it's, it's kind of silly. Uh, one of them is that they suspect that we're running commands, and I'll show you how we write modules in a little bit, kind of dive through some of the source tree to show you what's there. Uh, we don't. What we do is we use SSH more as a transport. Uh, we push modules to the remote machine. We run them. They emit JSON, and in the same step, we delete them. So what that allows us to do is have these uh, very declarative models of our, our resource management that make sure things look exactly like what they should. And, and uh, rather than having to scrape shell commands or output, which would be very error prone. But we have uh, various performance implementations. Uh, accelerated mode uh, doesn't, if anybody's running Ubuntu, this isn't really gonna come up, but if you're still running RHEL uh, five or six, you do not have a new enough SSH to support this thing called control persist, which is awesome. Um, so what control persist does is leaves SSH connections open uh, so that Ansible can just tap into them again later. It makes it really, really fast. But accelerated mode uh, uses SSH to set up a temporary daemon. It uh, has a TTL, so every time you, you manage something, you send a module down and it runs and it increments the TTL. Uh, but it's a really, really fast raw socket transport that uses uh, AES on top of uh, you know, standard packets, and it's really basic. Uh, you can use that for those older platforms. Rel7, thankfully, has a new enough SSH. And that, that constraint only comes in based on your control machine. So if you were to run Fedora as your control machine talking to the RHEL 5 host, you're fine. You can go ahead and use control persist. Um, and the pipelining option, there's a, a good blog if you go to ansible.com slash blog on Ansible performance tuning for fun and profit. Um, but pipelining is a clever hack that you should be able to turn on based on your sudoers configuration. And what pipelining does is it cuts the number of SSH ops in Ansible down by half by just uh, streaming Python over the SSH channel and not even doing an FTP or SFTP, and that will double the performance of Ansible. So uh, for those of you that are using uh, native SSH on something like Ubuntu, or RHEL 7, Fedora, um, you can turn pipelining on in Ansible.cdfg and, and things will, will fly by. 
Um, you may also want to tweak your control persist settings to uh, leave those open a little bit longer. That's also a configurable in that file. Um, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower is a commercial product that we have. Um, uh, but what it does is it provides a lot of features by kind of sticking on top of Ansible, and it just calls the command line. We don't ever hold any modules back from the open source, but it gives you role-based access control. So if you can imagine, I've got a team of people, and I want uh, people in this one team to be able to edit inventory so, like, my lab staff can add machines. Um, if I want certain people to run, be able to deploy to the QA infrastructure and only certain people to deploy to the production infrastructure, it's great for that. It gives you a really nice place to see the output of Ansible uh, streaming in in real time, digging into what hosts have failed and why. Uh, some really cool features for auto scaling. You can graphically sync with uh, you know your cloud and uh, and source control like Git, uh, subversion of Mercurial, and so on. And uh, it's actually pretty inexpensive, so you can get uh, 100 nodes for $100 a month. So normally that price is like 100 times that for some of the enterprise tools. So we, come, we make it easy because we know people start small, and uh, if you're interested, check it out. And if you want to just continue to use the open source stuff, that, that's fine, too. Um, so a few tips and tricks, uh, neat things about Ansible. We have this website, galaxy.ansible.com. So let me just go ahead and pull this up. What Galaxy is is an index of a lot of really nice open source content that allows you to... Uh, kind of get a jump start on your Ansible configuration. So suppose I want to search for roles for managing, uh, my browser is a little small here, Nginx, right? So I'm already on Nginx. So let's find all the, so I can define all these people's configurations for roles that they've written about Nginx, right? Let's set it up. And I can click on it and it's gonna, uh, I can rate things, I can see comments, and I can see the command line I would use to download this role. So that, it's basically just an index to GitHub. Um, but it's a great way to find a lot of content that's already out there. Um, most people end up customizing this stuff once they download it, but it, it's still a good way to find role, roles and, and get going. We have this thing called Ansible Vault. Uh, what Ansible Vault allows you to do is encrypt data on the file system. So if you want to check secrets in the source control and not have your team read them except for certain people um, and keep them in a public repo or whatever, you can do that. Um, it's basically using uh, AES ciphers with HMAC and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and when you run Ansible, you just specify the password you encrypted the files with, and it will unlock them in memory or in, in zip files or whatever, and allow you to keep secrets in there and use those variables as secrets. Um, here's a rolling update example. So I, I told you before the example was a little bit of a fake, and not really too much. You just didn't see the, the rolls coming here, but. Um, we have modules for all, all kinds of load balancers from net scalers to F5 to A10s to E2, EC2 elastic load balancers, rack space, cloud load balancers, uh, GCE uh, load balancers. So you can basically have something, a uh, step that says walk across my web servers. So, about, so assume I have 100 web servers and I want to update exactly five at a time. I can say take them out of a load balance pool. I might also take them out of a monitoring window uh, for those of you in ops that understand outage windows. Um, configure them, and if they're successful, put them back in. I can also include tests here. So I can run integration tests to decide if an upgraded server needs to go back in to that pool. Um, so you can kind of see some very advanced stuff where I'm taking 100 servers, I'm updating five at a time. I can configure it to say if, if all five of these fail, stop. Or I could say if any of them fail, completely stop. And I won't have taken my entire infrastructure down for an update. Uh, so this is exactly what Gawker does with uh, Citrix net scalers to basically do rolling updates 10 times an hour without, uh, without ever having any downtime for any of their users. So uh, I'm going to show a little bit of Python examples since this is the Python users group. Um, first off, modules can be written in any language that emits JSON. So if you go to github.com slash Ansible, you can see a repo called Ansible for Rubyists. Um, it's actually not that much harder than the Python one. The, the Python one allows you to um, use a bit more utility classes that we've written for everyone, and we require that everything be submitted to Core be Python just because it's easier for us to only think in one language. Um, and uh, actually, that second bullet is a lie. Uh, we just need to take that out. But you can write modules in Bash. You just have to be able to write JSON in Bash. So have fun with that. Um, plugins. Uh, so Ansible has all kinds of different plugins. Uh, like the way that it loops over things, like loops, you can have it 
loop over a data structure, you can have it loop over, um, you know, anything you, uh, at the source of a database, you know, talk to a web service, anything you want to do. Uh, that system is pluggable. The connection type, the fact that it uses Parameco and SSH, it's not limited to that. Uh, we talked about the accelerated mode daemon, that's an example of a connection plugin. Uh, Chris wrote our Windows connection plugin uh, that uses WinRM to talk to Windows host. Doesn't need SSH there. Um, basically, can talk to anything you want. Um, action plugins are basically server side modules. So, our template evaluation doesn't happen on the remote. It actually uh, happens on the control machine so that they, the remote machines see the absolute bare minimum amount of data that they need to see. So, they don't get the full dictionary of variables. They, they only get the template after it's been evaluated. So, uh, some of our modules have a server side or a control machine side and a remote side component to them. Um, and inventory, and that's probably the most interesting. So, suppose you're on Amazon Web Services and you have a bunch of machines tagged web server. So, rather than manually put those in machines in a group by IP address and they may auto scale and you don't know how many you're going to have tomorrow, uh, basically we have these uh, plugins that are built in that can say um, all the machines that are tagged in EC2 web server, right, uh, go in the web server group and I can talk to all the machines with that given tag. And I can basically use the cloud as my one source of truth about what machines I have and, and what kind of variables to return. Um, AWS is definitely the most evolved there. Uh, Rackspace, OpenStack, uh, there's a cobbler inventory source, anybody's using cobbler. Um, there's Ynode, DigitalOcean, lots of ways to just suck in all that's in your cloud with your uh, access credentials and instantly start managing it. Um, and again, an inventory script can be written in any language as long as it can emit JSON, just return the list of groups, and hosts and variables. Um, the, all the ones that are in core are, are in Python, just uh, as a matter of convention. Yes? Um, so, basically, we use the word module to reference a, a, basically, a Python program that gets transferred to a remote machine over transport and it runs. So, they're, they're basically our plugin-ish in the sense that you drop them in a directory and they are plugins, but they don't have to be Python. Um, and they're usually the units of work that, that reach out and touch your system, right? The things that do the real thing. So, an example would be like the Postgres module that sets up the Postgres database, right? Um, so, there's a Python API for Runner, uh, but I don't really consider it too much of an API that I want people to use so much. Um, we kind of concentrate on developing for the, the CLI tool itself. Um, Tower has a REST API though that's really, really good. Um, it uses Django REST framework. Um, if anybody's using Django and has not seen Django REST framework, it is pretty awesome. Um, we picked it over at Pi because it was uh, not quite as automagical, but allowed us to very well customize things, so develop sub-resources in REST, um, and it has a really nice API browser, so if you go to slash API, you can click through and find all the endpoints. Um, if there's any, if there's any library that I'm just like super enamored with, um, that's definitely one of them that's made our life very, very easy. Um, so some of the internal stuff we use is requirements. Um, we require a Python 2.6 uh, from the management machines, and that was just kind of done to address a wide number of distros. But we still only require Python 2.4 on the remote nodes, and that's so that we can manage uh, EL5. So it's getting to be uh, Enterprise Linux and 5 is getting to be less common, but it's still out there and it's important that we can manage it. Um, and we're still on Python 2 for now. And the reason for that is really the distributions. Once, once we start seeing somebody say, we only have Python 3 and you can't install Python 2 easily, uh, we'll worry about that, but that time is not now. They're really different languages. Um, we'd probably go with something like 6 and uh, as a library, 6 is a compatibility thing, um, to support you know 2, 6, and 3 if uh, we didn't have to do those remote node stuff, but supporting uh, Python 3 and Python 2.4 is basically impossible, so we're not even going to try uh, with, with that just yet. Um, the time comes, we'll be ready, and we'll do it. Um, and this no bootstrapping philosophy, which is if I can SSH into a machine, I can start managing it with Ansible. So there's a module called raw, which allows me to execute raw shell commands even if there's no Python, so I can technically even bring up Python. Um, and for all of you out here that come from the networking background, uh, Cisco, um, you know, I think there's various people that are working on trying to get modules together. Uh, Arista and Juniper have existing modules. Cumulus is, is absolutely brilliant because you can just lay down files for configuration on the, the operating system restart services. So uh, I'm a big fan of them. 
Um, you can also basically modules can speak to APIs. They don't have to use SSH, right? So, uh, for instance, we're talking to a NetScaler, we're talking to an F5. F5, for instance, uses SOAP API. So, uh, Ansible is not limited to just just to things that it can SSH into. Um, so, yes. You mentioned fashionable log is the current open. Uh, um, yeah, not Heartbleed. Bash shock, shell foo, shell shock. I saw the, the the new logo today. It was pretty awesome. So, so is, is that going to affect your Um, it does not. So we're not. Uh, we don't have any bash stuff that basically takes user input and puts it into an environment variable. Okay. So we're not particularly affected. Um, it, you know, we don't have a we don't have to have the hosting environment that allows you to to set those kind of things. You know, CGI would be a a big problem, right? Uh, the other question is, you, you would gener potentially generate a JSON file out, out on your client Yes. at the end of whatever work was being done, and then you said you would delete it. Not necessarily. So the JSON files don't actually get created. They just submit JSON over standard out. Right. Um, so like for the Python ones, the arguments are baked into the module when it gets sent over. So we template the module, we transfer the file, and it self-deletes all in like that. Um, so it doesn't stay on the file system, but for a very short amount of time. And then for some of the, it's probably liable to change the, like if you have pipeline turned on, it doesn't even write the file system at all. Um, if you have a non-Python module, it will transfer the transfer the arguments file, but it still outputs JSON to standard out. So the argument zero is the name of the JSON file is input for non-Python module. So it's not, it's not actually touching the hard drive? Um, the input is, the output is not. Because I was going to ask you to do a secure delete, but if you're, if you're not ever really outputting the No, it, it doesn't. That would be up to the file system. Yeah. Um, so libraries that we use that are, I, I guess, like uh, significant, uh, multiprocessing for managing multi multiple forks in Python. Um, I sort of have a love-hate with multiprocessing. It's very cool. It does a lot of very nice magic. Um, if you try to do things like uh, hook control C in intelligent ways, which we've had to do. It, it makes it a little interesting, and you you can't use all that auto magic. Uh, so we we've kind of solved that. Um, we our native SSH plugin for remote is actually performing better than Paravico. Uh, if you have control persist, if you don't have control persist, selling out to SSH will kill you. As, as there's a lot of handshake overhead compared to Paravico, but uh, I've actually found that Open SSH is kicking Paravico's butt. Uh, but we're glad that it's there. Uh, Paramico is what, what Fabric uses by default, and it's a very it's a very good library um, for working. Uh, I'm not a big fan of internals, so I've had to dig in there a few times in the past, but it's okay. Um, so uh, PyYAML for reading YAML files, JSON library, obviously for reading JSON files, uh, Jinja2 for templating, uh, which has been mostly pretty good. I'm happy with it, the way that Ansible uses it. Um, and, and obviously subprocess because we're, we're calling a bunch of shell things. We try to use APIs whenever we can, uh, but it's still useful to call command line tools. So uh, there's a lot of that. Um, so I'm kind of at the end. I do have my hiring. I do have my hiring slide. I was afraid I didn't. Uh, if you go to Ansible.com, you can find links to everything. But the website again to remember is docs.ansible.com, and that will will tell you how to get started and all that kind of good information. Uh, my email address, michaelanansible.com, and I'm, I'm laser llama at Twitter because, like, MP Dahan was taken or something, and I don't know why. Um, yes. RHN? Y yes, yes. Um, so we do have modules for, like, subscribing to um, – let me get to questions in just one second. Um, but, yeah. Um, we do have modules for subscribing machines to it uh, and, and managing subscription managers. So there's two of them. They were both written by uh, James Blasco, who works for BNQA, who used to actually be working for Red Hat. Um, I will show you where those are. Um, but if you basically go to docs.ansible.com, and if you don't know, uh, you know where a module is, you can just go module index all. And yeah, so Red Hat subscription is the new one. And I think there's one for RHN as well. Yeah, RHN channel and RHN register are kind of the old ones for the, the, the older versions of things. Um, and I also want to say that we're hiring. Um, so these positions are, for those of you that 
On the WebEx, that might not be an RDU. These are remotable, uh, but generally we're looking for people out of our, our Durham office in American Tobacco. Uh, we're hiring for uh, our API position, which is Django, Django RESTful Framework, Celery, and Postgres. Uh, we have a QA automation position open, which is extremely automation heavy, very, very little manual. Uh, so REST, Python, and Selenium. Um, we use AngularJS, so if you know any UI people that are looking for work, well, Angular Bootstrap, uh, we, you know, I suspect everybody can learn anything. If you've got Ruby friends that want to learn Python, you know, we're, we're happy to take them. Um, and to work on the Ansible core project itself, uh, so that uses Python and has, you know, obviously requires lots of uh, systems knowledge. Um, and you can email, like, jobs at Ansible.com with your resume and your, your cover letter, and there's jobs on our website as well. Um, I did definitely want to turn things over for questions. Um, for those of you that are on the phone, um, I'm not sure what the best way to do that would be. I don't know if you had ideas. Do we want to do? Uh, they, can, they can do that in the chat. That sounds good. Let's see if I can get chat to show up here. Yeah. All right. Um, Excellent. So if anybody has, uh, has questions, feel free to add them to chat. Um, how about how about from the room? Anyone? Yes. Um, we generally try to take things that we don't have to deprecate and maintain them for a pretty long life cycle. So the case of RHN having new and old is they actually have a new system of, of registering that's incompatible with the old system. So depending on what uh, platform you're on or whatever, you, you have to use a different uh, configuration management. Uh, thank you, Raj, for the plant question. <laughs> um, um, but, but yeah, so like the, I, I think we haven't had to cut the like one or two modules from core. Um, we're trying to be really careful about what we take on. Um, so, uh, but, but we will do that. Um, I think one of the things that we're doing on the development list pretty soon is we're going to split the modules out into some separate repos just to manage them a little bit easier and have kind of like a core set of modules that we might respond to pull requests a little bit quicker on. Um, but in general, no, I think it's been pretty good. Galaxy is kind of where the community content lives and roles, so those are usually YAML. They usually don't contain code, um, and anybody can submit there. And we don't curate that, but what we do is we let people rate it and comment on it. And, uh, you know. This is all on, like, if there's a lot of on there, you want to see you can, like, some questions on there. And there's a huge proliferation of third-party add-ons yeah, one of the examples of like uh, I've been trying to do is like so the Galaxy command line tool to download roles is part of Ansible. Um, I want to I encourage people to contribute to the project and like let's hash it out on the list and figure out what we want versus like build another ecosystem tool. And there are people that have written one like so some guy wrote this other role management tool and it's not very good, right? So I want people to know that what's in the core is, is usable and everybody's welcome to contribute to that and make it better. Um, it's not just us for kind of like shepherding that community, but. Um, so, for uh, let me get a few questions from the chat. Uh, pros and cons compared to Puppet and Chef. Um, so, Puppet and Chef are both, but they both have remote agents, so you have to set them up and use them. Uh, that's kind of the big one, but I think it's mostly complexity to write the automation that matters. So, Ansible, it's, uh, in my opinion, much faster to be able to write things. I'm much more deeply familiar with Puppet. Um, Puppet makes me bang my head against the desk, and I'm not saying that because I write in school. Uh, I, 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 I hate it. Um, I worked for them. I mean, at the time, it was the best thing that was out there. Uh, I think we moved on. Um, but to be honest, using something is better than nothing every single time. So if you don't like Ansible, use something. But uh, Ansible is easier to write and read. It's easier to deploy software on because it's order-based. It's so straightforward. Uh, it can replace Fabric and Capistrano as well as just your config management system. Um, and it has a lot more modules in core. So there's 230 some modules in core versus like 80 or something like that. Um, I, I kind of feel that we're a little bit more of an open source project uh, based on the, the contribution numbers. So I think we have uh, about two and a half times as many core contributors at this point. Um, and, uh, but anyway, try things out, right? So Ansible, you should be able to learn in the lunch hour. Uh, 
maybe don't do it on do it a couple of times instead of the lunch hour, but it should take an hour to write, you know, kind of dig through the first part of the tutorial, write a playbook, uh, hopefully less, uh, and, and see if you like things. Um, the, the another question we had, does it work if you want to set environment variables on the remote host? Yes, it does. So if you Google Ansible environment variables, I'll show you how this works. There is a document about setting environments and working with proxies, and I only mentioned proxies because this is one of the cooler examples, but any command you can pass arbitrary environment variables to it. Um, but one example that I had at, at a particular spot was I had to work with multiple proxies. So, so I got some yum things through one proxy, I got some packages through another proxy, some packages I didn't use a proxy at all, and normally what you do is you set that up in the system configuration, and that wasn't working. So Ansible actually allows you to define the environment for every single task. Uh, you can define it in a variable and reuse it. Um, and you have a lot of control. So you can pass environment variables to basically anything. Um, does it work with system D? Why, yes, it does. Um, so the service module in Ansible um, abstracts out all the differences between system five and it, upstart, system D, uh, DSD, RC scripts, and maybe a couple more. So it kind of determines what sort of system you have by looking at your operating system and your, your file system layout, and then it will um, know how to start that service by based on finding what it is. Um, the interesting thing is not only do, is it like you're gonna have one of those NIT systems, on some systems you could actually be running two or three of them. So uh, that's kind of uh, definitely a lot of the, the sort of the secret sauce of that module. Um, and a question? Yes. Sometimes when I'm uh, using Ansible, I, I find myself wanting to break a playbook down into the task level and run it like it's in a debugger and step through the task yes. the There actually is a uh, step command to Ansible. I want to say that it's dash dash step, but if you do Ansible playbook dash dash help, it'll tell you what it is. We'll basically do the bash style, like you know, when you're booting a computer in interactive mode, it's exactly like that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Does see another question in the room? Uh, yes, in the back. Yes, so uh, the question was, are there abstractions for different, uh, oh, I'm sorry, could I repeat the questions before I answer them? Yes. So, uh, what, what was my last question about? Dash, dash, dash. Yes, there, uh, could we do interactive launching and kind of prompt things along the way? Yes, there's a dash dash step for that. Um, the question in the back was about abstractions. Yes. The one thing that most people ding Ansible for is, the package manager actually requires you to say what package manager you're using. Uh, that is intentional. So if you think about between uh, Ubuntu and Red Hat, like not only does Apache na be named HTTPD on one, it's named Apache on the other one or Apache 2, it has different dependencies. The files that you configure it are in a different place. So I actually want people to consciously make the decision of knowing what package manager they're talking to. Um, and also because there's features available in Yum that aren't available in Apt, and we want to expose them directly. So Ansible has a conditional uh, statement, so I can say, uh, do this when Ansible OS family is Red Hat, right? I can do that, do this when Ansible OS family is Debian, uh, which includes Ubuntu. Um, I can do all that kind of stuff. The service module already contains those abstractions and knows how to work on all those platforms. Generally, every single module is uh, cross platform the users and groups one knows about BSD and knows it's about whatever. Um, the only thing is with the package manager, I want you to know what that is. Just like you need to know if you're getting some things from PIP, some things from Gem, something from Yum. Um, that's the only really noticeable change. And um, there's uh, a, you know, I think if that's the only one thing people think us for on, on the, the OS platform thing, it's a good thing, but in the end, uh, I think there's a lot of people that prefer that approach because uh, it's very clear that this step applies here. And frequently we'll do that with, you can say include these tasks for this OS. Um, there's also a really cool thing you can do in Ansible and say um, dynamically select this group of machines where this is true um, and just talk to those machines. So you can say carve out all my Red Hat machines and do just this with them with SE Linux. Now talk to everything. Um, so that makes a really nice output. Um, so uh, I had a, a, a question, something I did discuss a little bit earlier. Why only Python 2X? Um, the answer is the distribution. So Python 2X is still everywhere, Python 3 is not. Um, and we'll deal with Python 3 when that comes out. But right now, uh, Python 2 is the standard and we support, um, we support the uh, 
your ability to um, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought. It was like rambling there. Um, so basically, because we have to support two four on remote nodes, we have to um, we have to do uh, we can't use Python three yet on the control machine. And uh, at some point, we're going to have to change that, and that should not be a big change. And there's good libraries to help us do that when the time comes. So Ed was asking, uh, how is your two factor authentication support? Um, I would say it's terrible. Um, so what people normally do to achieve PCI compliance is they will have a VPN. They will two-factor into the VPN, and they will run Ansible uh, from within that uh, environment so that the two-factor authentication is achieved by the VPN. Um, what happens if you're using Ansible Tower is Ansible Tower can hold on to your SSH keys, give you a record of everybody that, that's been doing anything, and that can be a really, really good solution for compliance purposes. Uh, we have a lot of users that are um, needing to do PCI things and uh, asking us that question, and every single time uh, the VPN has been enough to uh, achieve their, their requirements. Um, it does work with Kerberos tickets, if that, if that helps, but um, it might not. Uh, yes, question in the back. Uh, does Ansible uh, do anything in terms of controlling the performance of the Ansible deploy with the deploy? Does, okay, so does Ansible do anything to control its performance impact on the, the managed systems it's talking to? Um, not really. Um, what happens with Ansible is when it's not talking to the remote systems, it's not running. So um, it's completely unfair to use this comparison now, but Puppet used to consume 400 megabytes of RAM in certain instances on remote machines. Since Ansible is agentless when it's not running, it's not consuming any RAM at all. It's not consuming any CPU. So I've seen Fedora graphs of their legacy config management before they went to Ansible. In the middle of their puppet runs, they'd see a negative load spike, right, or a positive load spike, where they basically be losing web connections. And um, that doesn't really happen because there's very little computation in Ansible. The modules are pretty dumb. So it does run a small Python process that quickly exits. But in general, um, it's not too bad. What the, the performance implications are usually just that you need enough RAM on the control machine. Um, yes. I mean, it's not doing a lot. You're talking about running an extra Python script, probably, so it's, it's not going to be very, very heavy. Um, yeah, you don't want to be running your server at 100% utilization, right? Um, but, hey. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so, so the, the comment was, yeah, rolling updates help a lot with that, right? Take the server out of production. Um, Ansible, the best config tool in already for rolling updates by far, just because it's been the use case we designed it for. Um, question up front. I'm sorry, was the... Was, oh, yeah, so the template module is what I would usually use. So, like, the template module says, um, go ahead and drop this file based on a Jinja2 template into this remote directory. Um, or you can just use the copy file module to uh, push the, the log rotate config to the remote end. Um, I, I don't recall if log rotate needs to restart after you do that, but if so, you can use a handler. But templates would be the way that I always do it. Like, Tower uses Ansible to set it up, and we use, we use log rotate, too. What is the best way to get started with module development? Um, I have a web page for that, because I forget. Um, I wrote all, most all of these. Um, you go to developer information on the website, and you can read about developing modules, and this will tell you everything that you would want to know. Um, so it probably walks you through the process. Um, fixing a bug is one of the better ones by far, and just kind of looking to see what's there. And we also have in the development guide, we also have this document on help testing pull requests, which can be also very good as well. So if you just want to kind of you know, kind of get involved in testing Ansible first. Um, you're welcome to do that as well. That would help us out tremendously. But uh, yeah, all the development documentation is pretty much on the wiki. Um, the core of itself, other than modules, is not as well documented as the meaning. But uh, we try to give most of the pointers. So developing plugins talks about like action plugins and things like that. 
Um, yes, Joseph. So the biggest problem that I have is basically my plugging playbook. Um, sometimes the restart of service doesn't actually happen, or stop takes so long that start is happening before it start stops. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is there a better way to do this? Sometimes. So one of the, the major problems about like restarting services specifying a knit script is, huh? Oh, sorry, repeat the question. So the problem is what happens when init scripts don't really do what they say? So they, a services start and don't, haven't really started or take longer to stop. Um, bad init scripts are still a problem. They are terrible. There are lots of bad init scripts. They may be in your favorite distribution already. They may be in some of your favorite packages. Um, so Ansible has a, if something isn't reporting status, there's a pattern argument to the service module. That can be used to check the process table to see if it's running. That can give you a little better status. But if it's returning when it's not ready and the init code is bad, I would consider replacing the init scripts. And I would file a bug with your distribution. Um, we have a lot of workarounds for specific things. So if you find something like it's easy to tell from the output that a very common package is just lying, we have a few of those in the tree. I forget all, there's like a couple of them, but uh, we just worked around them because so many people were reporting uh, bugs and we're like, well, we can't do anything, but you know, so we did a little bit of something to to kind of uh, fake it out a little bit. Um, yeah, yes. Okay. Sure. Um, so when you run Ansible, I, I did not give a live demo. Um, I should, but um, basically you run the output when you run it, and there's a debug module that can actually output the value of the variables. You can either run that. It's a popular. Thing. There's also a pause module you can use if you like want to make it stop at a particular point. Um, generally, you shouldn't have to open a software debugger. Um, you just run it and kind of based on the output decide if you need to change something in your configuration and then and then rerun it again. Uh, yep. Yeah. And tags. Tags are great. So tags allow you to basically say in your playbook, um, just run these things that are with these labels. So you could say just run the config steps or just run the database steps. And that can allow you to skip all the other steps in your playbook and, and run things much, much faster. Um, yes, other questions? Um, um, so the question was, could you use the DNS server to figure out what, uh, what servers you had? Um, I guess if you ran on the DNS server, you could maybe query its API or something. Um, it's like it's a Mac table. I don't, I don't, I've never seen anybody try that. It seems like it would be possible. Um, but most people usually use, um, use one of the cloud sources. So like if you go to github.com Ansible, um, in plugins inventory, you can see all the dynamic inventory sources we have. Um, so libcloud, uh, so that kind of supports generic clouds. Cobbler, Collins, that's a CMDB that, that uh, I want to say Tumblr uses. Uh, Docker, uh, you can talk to EC2, Google Compute Engine. You can see what jails are available in BSD locally. You can talk to Linode, OpenShift. And, but any of these are usually pretty simple. So um, I'm just going to pull up the, the, let's see, EC2 one's not simple. I'll just pull up the Cobbler one because it's, it's basic. Um, what you can see is it's basically talking to a remote API and then just, uh, actually this one's not simple. I, I wrote this API back when I didn't know anything. So uh, not the Ansible API, but the Cobbler API. So it's like, it's XMRPC pre-rest and everything. So it's horrible. Um, but anyway, it's really simple. You just submit JSON and there's documentation about how to do that. If you go to uh, docs.ansible.com, you click on uh, developer information and you say developing dynamic inventory sources will tell you all about how to write one of those. Um, yes. Um, so Ansible, whatever's in your host file, it will talk to it. So if you put it, it can talk to host names, it can talk to it. So the question was, what I think what happens if you put an IP versus a host name? Yeah, so you can put host names or, you can put host, you can put host names or IP addresses in the inventory file. Sorry, I didn't mean to be talking over you. <laughs> 
Um, so you could do either one of those things. I think his question was, can you use the DDoS as a source of truth to say, these are all the systems that I have? Um, and I think theoretically you could, it just depends on your DNS implementation. Like, yeah, if you, right, that could totally happen. If you want to submit a, uh, a uh, pull request for that, I think there'd be people that would be interested. I question, like, you'd have to, you'd probably want to get group information, like these machines are in certain groups somehow for it to be like super, super useful. No. Um, yeah, okay, right. So the question was more like, so you have a, a host name in there. Um, it's just gonna talk, what, what's Ansible we're gonna try to talk to? It's gonna try to talk to the, the, the first IP address that comes to that host. So um, if you're talking to something that has a management port or it's on a DMZ, uh, you, you basically want to put in the IP address to the management interface. Um, yes. All right. Cool. Any other any other questions? All right. Let me check chat real quick to make sure I do not have anything. And uh, oh, we do. Um, see that we have some question answering. Uh, two factor. We talked about most of the roles on Galaxy seem very platform specific. Is are people getting lazy writing these modules, or is it more difficult to make them agnostic? Um, I don't think people are getting lazy. I think they're, they're scratching an itch that, that, that fits their needs. So open source is very much about, like, I've shared something that I built, but very few people are wanting to solve a problem for a larger community. Um, so many of these people would probably take pull requests to make them uh, manage different things, but Ubuntu or, or Red Hat or whatever they were using was probably what uh, they decided to share. Um, there are some cross-platform roles in Galaxy, um, and, and it's definitely very easy to do. Um, okay, um, another question. Do you know of customers using Ansible for network device application, not just Cumulus, but products like Cisco slash Juniper, which are CLI based, and not like Cumulus, which can be managed like servers? If so, what are some of the use cases they have used it for? Um, absolutely, like I said, I do like, I do like Cumulus because you can just drop config files on it. Uh, Arista and Juniper are two very good examples. Both of them have APIs. The Arista module talks to the Arista API, the Juno talks to the Juno API, and they're very similar. So they can set up to do things like uh, ELAN configuration or setting up a lag, uh, Blue Cisco calls it a port channel, um, push some config templates. Um, they're rapidly evolving, uh, but recently, like for instance, Arista put content up in Galaxy. Um, I'll say we do not yet have a Cisco module using something like one TK or uh, NX API yet. Um, to, to talk to that. I prefer to see that other than the command line interface, uh, but I, I can't comment on that at this time. Um, so uh, last chance for questions. All right, I think, I think we're good. Um, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you very much for everybody at Cisco attending remotely. Um, we'll probably be making out your way soon because like that kind of meetup attendance is absolutely crazy for a remote one. Um, so, uh, Sorry, I couldn't have video here today, but you're, you're well appreciated. Um, again, if people have questions, michael at ansible.com. Um, I'll just leave the slide up for just a little bit. Um, and then, and once again, like I said, if you like Python, uh, we have lots of positions open. Also, uh, we're doing some really cool UI stuff as well. So uh, thank you very much for having us.